singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you guys enjoy this show, please help me make it better by either writing a very nice review on iTunes or you can simply go to the donations page and send us any funds that you seem uh, that you can spare. So uh, today my guest on the show would be also perhaps the youngest uh, guest that I have ever had. However, despite that fact, he's already an accomplished uh, scientific educator, social activist, blogger, aspiring filmmaker, and most recently the author of a very interesting book called Robots Will Steal Your Job, but that's okay. Federico Pistono is also an incoming student to Singularity University, and he is up for an amazing summer, and I have to admit I'm kind of jealous because I went through it and I want to relive it again, but uh, it's not happening, at least not this summer, so I'm very jealous, I have to admit, from the, from the get-go. Anyway, welcome Federico, and uh, it's very nice to have you on the show. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, thank you for having me. Fantastic. So. Let's jump right into the meat of the matter here by asking you, Federico, how did you get interested in technology to begin with? Okay, uh, I guess my interest in technology started from a very early age. I mean, I have stories coming from my mother that um, since as far back as I can remember, even, even before that, I was always working with stuff, um, tearing things apart and putting them back together, uh, trying to fix things that weren't broken to begin with, to see if I could make them um, better than they were before. Or, you know, I wouldn't always succeed, obviously. <laughs> so she would get mad and was like, it wasn't broken, why did you have to open it up? I was like, I wanted to know how it worked. So um, it, it always felt really compelling. Uh, from I guess I was, I don't know, one or two, I was already you know, building stuff. I, uh, I was actually building my first uh, things and inventing stuff before I could before I could speak. Um, so it, it was, and <laughs> the first word I said ever was the word uh, the word no. When somebody <laughs> somebody told me something and I said no. So always a question in nature, I guess. <laughs> That's very interesting. So, so let me ask you then, in your own words, um, would you qu qualify yourself as a social activist or a writer or a blogger or a scientist, first of all? I don't know. I mean, I've, I guess a combination of all of them. And well, at the same time, I can never be um, either one of them. Uh, decent enough to, to be called either a scientist or an author or a social activist. I guess I'm doing everything with, uh, I kind of have a light motive, so I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in science and technology, uh, but also in uh, how the world works in general, which is from the technical perspective, but also on the social aspect. And uh, my, my main interest is to really get to uh, the bottom of um, the bottom of the, the, the you know, the, the dirt, really, what, what lies behind, behind the veil of uh, perception that uh, kind of uh, is, is uh, brought upon over our eyes and we just see it and we are spectators, we are users instead of uh, hackers. And I'd like to be the guy behind uh, seeing how things work. And I don't know, I, I, I guess it just, it just went on throughout my whole life this way. So where does uh, Singularity University fit in within sort of your, the greater scheme of things in your own life? Oh, I got interested in the idea of Singularity when I came across a video by Ray Kurzweil. It was sent to me by one of the, at the time I was um, uh, one of the international coordinators of the Zeitgeist movement and I was the founder of the Italian chapter. And one of the members sent me a video of Kurzweil during an interview. And so from then on, I, I read all of his books and watched uh, the films, the videos, the interviews, the TED Talks, uh, the Google uh, author talks. And it was really intriguing. So I 
I basically devoured every single minute of video on YouTube, on the Singularity Institute, the Singularity University. So I followed up on um, Daniel Kraft, Over the Gray, all the authors and scientists and uh, physicists, mathematicians, uh, social scientists. I mean, everybody was just connected through uh, by the idea. And obviously, um, by having an interest in uh, science, technology, design, society, TED was a source of inspiration and enlightenment for me. And um, many of the themes connected with the singularity were presented in there, specifically with the Singularity University, which is to try and solve the, the, the world's grand challenges, you know, uh, water, um, poverty, uh, education, access to medicine, cheap energy, all the things that are connected to those are kind of my, my area of interest. So it, it's kind of hard for me to focus on a specific topic because I'm, I have so many interests that I, I guess I don't, I don't go through. <laughs> So, so let me ask you here then, uh, since you have such a wide spectrum of personal interests, uh, do you have any um, idea about your potential 10 to the 9th project or are you going with sort of an open mind and kind of see what's going to emerge from those 10 weeks um, as you are going to be there? Yeah, I do have some ideas, of course. Uh, I was lucky enough to spend a few months in a research center for renewable energy in Italy called the, the Renewable Energy Park, which is a um, research facility, but also uh, a kind of hotel structure. Uh, so you, you, you can go there and have a vacation as if it was a hotel, but it's completely run by renewable energies. And the interesting thing is it's built with the idea of efficiency. Instead of just saying, oh, we need, I don't know, 50 or 60 or 80 kilowatts uh, let's just splatter the whole thing with uh, photovoltaics and it will work out. No, we have to use the primary sources of energy for, you know, for heat. It's better to use heat directly or transform heat uh, as little as possible. And so it, it has the idea of uh, recycling water from the, um, the, the, the rainwater and utilize it intelligently so that the wastewater coming from uh, the shower goes to the toilet and then there is a special way of flushing the toilet so that it uses two to three liters instead of 15 to 20 as if we, you know, we usually use 15 to 20, which is such a, such a huge waste. And there are many, many things connected with that. And the whole thing is uh, based upon systems, systems thinking. Uh, so my, you know, I have some, now some expertise in that area of energy. Uh, then I have my background on social movements and activism. And then I have my computer science background in artificial intelligence, machine mm -hmm. learning, and you know I did some studies in there. So I, I have many many ideas that I, you know, I've I've got some ideas about the water project. Um, education is a hu huge interest to me. So I'm, I'm guessing I'm I'm kind of waiting for um, inspiration to come once again, yeah. so that I can focus on something with other people who think alike, and we can make. A, uh, a, a really well-defined and solid group to work synergetically together. Yeah, I think you'll be torn apart between all those options because you'll find absolutely incredible people in each of those fields. And on top of that, every one of them would probably pitch to you to become part of their team. So you would probably end up being torn apart. <laughs> but, but that's okay. It's, it's a good... I will be spaghettified, uh, like Stephen Hawking says, when you, get, when you approach a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good problem to have. Uh, anyway, I'd like to move on and talk a little bit uh, more about uh, your book. Uh, so, uh, first of all, the book's title is kind of uh, catchy and provocative. Robots will steal your job, but that's okay. So let me break it into two parts that I want to discuss separately. First of all, robots will steal your job. Why? And how? Robots, yes. Uh, I mean, historically, we have been through the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and now the information revolution. Now, we are seeing the effects of something that, um, for which we don't have a precedent for. So, um, economists and futurists, they always refer to the idea of technological unemployment as a fallacy. 
they call it the Luddite fallacy after uh, Ned Ludd, who you know he, he smashed the frame, uh, nightings and the, the, the textile. The spinning of, Jenny. Yeah. Uh, what? It was called, I think, the spinning Jenny, the weaving machine. Yeah, exactly. So um, they said, look, machines has all, have always come along, uh, bringing new technologies and improved efficiency, but we are not seeing widespread unemployment. We always find some, something else to do. And I yeah. said, yeah, sure, we did, because machines were doing dull jobs, stupid jobs, um, monkey jobs, machine jobs, repetitive, monotonous, easy to perform jobs. Right now, machines are becoming intelligent. They are becoming adaptive. They are not if-then-else kind of a situation. They have learning algorithms, um, recursive algorithms which learn through experience, just as we learn, uh, maybe not exactly the same way, but in a similar way. And Watson is an example of that, as we've seen. So it, it, computers are starting to permeating into the areas of the labor force um, for which we didn't expect computers to be in for another, I don't know, 20 to 30 or 50 years time. Most people didn't even expect to have computers within their lifetime to do this kind of uh, task, to perform well, this Well, let me challenge you here a little bit because uh, people have pointed out that artificial intelligence is always about 30 years away. Just like, uh, for example, fusion. Right? Yes. And, and so since the 1950s, the original <laughs> uh, conference in artificial intelligence where the term was laid down and you had all the, the sort of the forefathers of the, of the science getting together, they expected that by the late 80s or early 90s and the 2000s at the latest, we would already have how, basically. Right. I mean, uh, and that didn't happen. And it seems that, again, we are about 30 years away from, from how. Well, I wouldn't agree to that, but uh, the problem is something else. Uh, it's, it's a problem of definition, and I have a couple of chapters dedicated to that in the book. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what is intelligence? So people, when, when they think about artificial intelligence, they refer to a computer acting, well, actually, they refer to robot acting anthropomorphically. So they act like us, they think like us, they do the same things as we do, and they are indistinguishable, kind of like the replicators in, uh, I mean, the, the replicants in um, Blade Runner or something like that. Or, you know, some people call it strong AI or general artificial intelligence. The problem is, well, computers don't work like we do, and they don't require general artificial intelligence to surpass us in most of the activities we do, especially those activities that are in the labor market. So not related to, let's say, uh, poetry or art or um, creativity and things that um, really require a high level of sophistication in the uh, algorithms that you develop. So, I mean, I should have called the book um, Machine Intelligence uh, Will Eventually... Uh, no, uh, computer Algorithms Will Eventually Steal Your Jobs Within 25 Years. But it wasn't really a catchy title, so I just said robots will steal the job. But the thing is, um, robotics is much harder than artificial intelligence. And even artificial intelligence, there is a misconception of what it means. So if you look at Google, Google News does a job that no human can do. I mean, it aggregates millions of news articles by type, by relevancy, by... Um, uh, it, it, it kind of understands the concept, even if the word understand may not apply to the situation, but it creates a context uh, by which we give meaning to the context, but it makes sense for us. Mm. And the job it does, the job Google News does, is impossible to do for a human. So they already surpassed us in that specific thing. And they're starting to, they're starting to enter into those kind of jobs that we didn't think um, we would ever dream of leaving the machines to do. So you don't need general artificial intelligence or strong AI or a, a computer to pass the Turing test to displace most of human labor. It's already happening. So the widespread unemployment in some places like um, 
Greece, Portugal, Spain. I mean, it's reaching 20, 23, 27, 30, 35 percent unemployment. And that doesn't count the people who have stopped looking for a job in the first place. Yeah, but people would argue that the Greek or the Spanish uh, unemployment crisis are not the result of robots. I mean, those nations are not exactly the most robotized nations in the world to begin with. If what you say is true, wouldn't it be the case that we would find examples in South Korea and Japan, perhaps Singapore, Taiwan, and so on, that should be, according to your example, the most highly unemployed countries in the world, because they're also the most roboticized. Right. I mean, there is not a exactly a direct relationship because there are social aspects. So, for instance, in Germany, they reduced the work week in order to have more people working, and that's a really that's a really smart thing to do. Um, but similar, I mean, in South Korea and Japan, they have a highly educated uh, culture in science and math, which doesn't happen in the United States. In fact, the United States has now the highest unemployment rate of the last 30 years. And before that, it makes no sense because women weren't even in the, in the labor force. So you, you couldn't make a comparison with those, uh, with those times before 1986 or 7, I don't remember. So the problem is, it's happening in the United States and it's happening in Europe. It's happening in those places where you wouldn't think it was possible. It's happening, for instance, um, I, I have a friend who's a, a manager in a multinational corporation in Norway. And um, they used to have dozens of, dozens, dozens of people working on the ship to extract omega-3 from the krill in the ocean. Yeah. And now they basically have everything automated and they have just three people in there. And next year, they expect to only have two people. And probably, in a few years, it will be completely automated. Or maybe they just have one person just supervising the whole thing. And the same happens in South Korea. One of the biggest um, cruise ships for transporting um, containers, it's I like a kilometer long. It's, it's a, this ginormous ship. Hundreds of people used to work in there. Now there is just three of them. And everything else is roboticized. There, is this, there are these robotic arms moving the containers up and down, and they have RFID chips. Uh, so the, the whole thing is managed automatically. And this is not a new story. I mean, it, it's always been happening. The problem is that now computers are doing the tasks that even highly skilled humans take many years to do. So the problem is. People say, all right, no problem. We have robots doing most more sophisticated jobs. Well, that will create new markets. And then we'll just have to do even more sophisticated jobs as humans working together. And I say, sure, that works for a very small percentage of the population. Probably the newly employed who are getting a PhD in biotechnology and synthetic biology and um, neuroscience and uh, biochemistry and computer science and physics and mathematics. What about the rest of 80% of the population? What are they going to do? What about the people who are, who are 45 now and have been doing for 25 years a job that a machine is going to do now? Well, I mean, you could have made the same argument in the Industrial Revolution by saying that, you know, farmers started becoming members of the proletariat uh, and shepherds had to go to the city and urbanize and, you know, find jobs in the production line and, you know, not all shepherds would make good production line workers and, and so on. But okay, how long does it take to make, yes, but how long does it take to make a production line worker? A few weeks, maybe a few months of training, that's it. How long does it take to make a biotechnologist? Well, I don't know because I, I know that it took a few decades to sort of complete that s sort of a transition, fundamental transition. And that's transition. exactly the issue because of the way of the exponential function. When you grow small numbers, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like much. But when you grow big numbers, then it gets really out of hand. And mm -hmm. we are starting to grow the big numbers now. So 20 years, we'll have a completely different world. Actually, in five years, we're, we're going to have a completely different world. And in 10 years, it's, it, it's completely unpredictable in my mind. So structural adjustment to the whole society take a long time because of social acceptance, because people are slow, because people are fear. They, you know, FUD, 
fear and um, uncertainty and doubt. That creates a, a delay. And that delay is potentially catastrophic. Because if you, I mean, we are experiencing 25, 30% unemployment if you combine the numbers of people who have stopped looking for a job in the first place, even yeah, in the United States. I agree entirely, but again, that's not the, it, at all the case in Japan and in, in South Korea, right? So my claim would be that's not to do with robots. That's more to do with the sort of geopolit geopolitical situation, the debt crisis, the sort of all those other issues, you know, that we have in countries like Spain, Greece, uh, Ireland, you know, the, the house bubble and, and all those things, right? Whereas traditionally Japan and Korea have had half of our unemployment even in Canada to give you to tell you the truth yeah, yeah, I mean, the situation yeah. is pretty bad overall compared to the rest of the world we're much 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 better off sure I mean there are many factors contributing and the bad policies bad politicians bad um, financial institutions they are certainly exacerbating the problem Mm -hmm. But the real issue is that what technology, the kinds of jobs that technology displaced up to now were easily replaceable. Where you could easily find new jobs for unskilled labor or for even relatively skilled labor to do. But right now, I mean, they're taking up the, the role of journalists, of um, brain scanners and, I mean, radiologists. They're taking up the job of lawyers. Uh, yeah. These are jobs that, you know, it takes 10, 20, 15, 20 years to study, um, get, a, get a diploma, do your internship, um, get some experience, and then start to do the job. So if it takes 10 to 15 to 20 years to do these jobs for highly skilled, highly intelligent people who went to college, what about the truck driver who's going to be displaced by the automated cars? What's he going to do? I mean, there are no more unskilled labor jobs like Walmart or um, delivery or, you know, truck driving or taxi driving or um, bringing up and down boxes from the, the delivery store. Those jobs will be automated. So yeah, I see your point. And especially, say, imagine if you have a doctor or a lawyer wh whom professions that take, say, a decade to, to develop and you have the computers which are able to learn instantaneously, you know, with a single yeah, upload. They don't, they don't sleep, yeah. they work 24-7, they're more accurate, yeah. they have no pension, they have no, they, they don't get sick, they, they don't ask for benefits, they, they don't riot, they don't complain. They, they, you have so many less problems with robots from the point of view of the company. And just look at the new companies. The new companies employ a tenth or a hundredth or even a thousandth of the companies that were created 20, 40, 50 years ago who make the same amount of money. So, yes, there are new jobs created, but there are very, very few and highly specialized. And these jobs, they disappear soon after they are created in the first place. So, the problem is that we live in an ever-evolving, complex, always moving, always changing, um, developing organism called society. And we're not ready for it because our educational system is completely inadequate at preparing people for these kind of changes. And Singularity University is an attempt to redeem exactly. these educational problems. But there are 80 students every year, and um, you know Stanford and uh, they cost twenty, forty thousand dollars a year uh, to go to. However, there is a solution, and that's the but that's okay part. Exactly. I wanted to, to, to get to that part and saying, so, so we've painted the picture here. We've set out the, the sort of the foundation and we've accepted that robots will steal your job one way or another. But how is that okay? Yes. I mean, it, it's okay only if you look at it from a different perspective. So what seems like a crisis could become an opportunity. So by, ironically, the very thing that creates the problem can also be the solution to the problem we created. So technology is displacing human labor and we have a structural problem in there. Um, and this problem will only exacerbate from the point of view of the labor market where you have um, labor for income, income for sustaining your life, your family and whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. Now if you break this cycle, you could leverage exponential expanding technologies 
to emancipate yourself from the shackles of the monetary system or the money uh, making system and you know the, the labor market system so one way would be to utilize free online resources for instance to educate yourself to become a thinker more flexible to be self-employed uh, you could downshift if you reduce your need for money in the first place by leveraging these technologies you can empower yourself to become self well the more self-sufficient you become and the more resilient you are within your community and your community could be an extended community not just your neighborhood but you know I'm connecting through the internet with you and you are uh, 4,000 kilometers away from me and we are basically using a free tool so I mean right now we are experiencing the most dramatic and exciting time to be alive in, in absolutely, I mean, it has never been so exciting uh, of a time uh, to live in the, on this planet. I mean, ju just just look at what's happening. All the major universities in the world are giving free online education at the highest quality yeah. over the internet for free. I mean, it, it, the Khan Academy is completely open source. The code is there. You can yeah. use it. You can have your own students. I mean, I, I've been I've been teaching um, children. Uh, about science, about math, about technology, and I'm using the Khan Academy as a tool, and um, I have this dashboard where I can see all my students and how well they're doing. I can tutor them when they have a problem, and it's these are liber these are on one side they are um, problematic technologies if you don't know how to handle them, but they can be liberating technologies if you can know how to leverage them, and by and you know in this area information is the new oil, is the new air, is the new uh, water, is the new everything. So information is really the key to liberating yourself from any um, shackle that you can have. And I would like to be an enabler of this information. So I'm really just, uh, I don't know, remixing what I, what I get from, from, you know, from people I meet, from the videos I watch, from the things I study. And I'm kind of giving it out to uh, the normal people who are usually don't bother to read through all the statistics and the articles and the peer, peer review. I kind of make a package, a bundle, which is accessible to the general public, and I give it to them so that they can have uh, some tools that they can use in their lives to um, live a little bit better and, you know, maybe live happier. I mean, mm -hmm. in the end, we, we, I kind of ask myself, well, why are we doing this? I mean, why are we bothering working and getting money? And I mean, what's the purpose? What's the meaning of all of this? Yeah. So if, if the meaning of life is to work so that you can get money, so that you can buy the things you need, so that, and, and then the cycle goes on. So it's, is there nothing else? Or, you know, during the commercial breaks, you, you have your, your life? I mean, this makes no sense to me. So just stop, step back, think about what you're doing, and maybe we can escape this uh, overconsumption, overarching problem that's exacerbating with this idea, this, this idea of growth, uh, which is unsustainable from the physical point of view and from the mathematical point of view. And um, think about the important things in life, uh, human relationships, art, music, uh, science, the, the thrill of discovering, the thrill of uh, creating a community and sharing ideas, these are the things that matter. Yeah, so, right. so you're throwing in some very uh, relevant sort of philosophical uh, takes on what, what it all means and why we're doing it and what sort of the good life that we should be aiming for. Uh, but let me ask you this, you know, a few hours from now, I actually have uh, an appointment with Daniel H. Wilson, um, who is the author of a couple of cool books. One of them is called uh, How to Survive a Robot Uprising, and the other one is called Robopocalypse. Um, and actually, next year, Steven Spielberg is making um, a movie on that book. So um, in that uh, sort of vein of thought, let me ask you this. Um, why would robots just steal our jobs? Why wouldn't they steal everything? Well, that's a possibility. Um, of course, 
again why I, would they stop at, at the job i mean it's a, it's a small planet yeah i mean they're, they're programmed to to steal our jobs really because the, the the market system requires them to do that i mean if you are in the market system and you want to stay afloat you want to stay alive you have to be competitive the only way to be competitive is to increase your productivity per employee and the only way to do that is to have more skilled employee which requires a lot of time to train and to, there, are, there are many variables they can you know they can have children they can go nuts or uh, they have a spiritual journey and they go to tibet i don't know what whatever happens the easiest way is to automate just get a machine to do the job so we are telling the machines to do that and the bottom line is machines will do until they reach um, consciousness if that term even applies to machines um, what we tell them to do and what we tell them to do is really just a reflection of our zeitgeist of our um, cultural yeah. society the, the, the cultural trend in the society so if if we still live in 20 years time in this idea of overconsumption conspicuous consumptions endless growth and co uh, mindless competition and, and everyone for himself and selfishness and if these are the values still in place in 20 years time we won't be there in 20 years time i can tell you that much I, you know the future is unpredictable but this this thing i, I can i can safely say it's going to happen if we don't change our values and that's so why you think uh, humanity may end up going extinct actually within the next few decades Well, if we don't change direction, it could happen. I mean, you know, the Tower of Babel uh, or uh, Atlantis, it's, uh, we are the authors of our own demise. But we could also be the enabler of our, you know, most wonderful creation. And to me, it seems pretty clear that the path that has been laid out in the past 20 years uh, by the people who advocate the selfish, competitive, free market um, approach, money-oriented society, conspicuous consumption, that will lead us to destruction. Mm -hmm. But I see many, many positive things happening from communities all around the world who are trying to create a better system, a better value system. That is, because technology just follows. Because technology just does what whatever the value system requires it to do. So if, if our value system is to live better and be happier and improve our relationships, our um, love for discovery, for art, for uh, science, for exploration, uh, for um, positive thinking, challenging authority, uh, collaboration, if these things are incentivized, those are the values of the system, then we'll create technology that enables those values to accelerate in an exponential way. Well, I, I have to say that uh, you're up for some rough patches uh, ahead <laughs> because uh, Singularity University is kind of, when I say rough patches, it's kind of uh, reminding me to my own personal experience to some degree because, uh, and that's not necessarily a criticism, but uh, Singularity University is very pro-capitalist very pro-entrepreneurial, very pro sort of, um, I don't want to say Darwinian, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's based in Silicon Valley. So oh, yeah. all I mean, those don't things get me there wrong. Don't get are... Me wrong. I, I may have sounded uh, inadequate in my, dis in my description. Um, the entrepreneurial um, aspect and the, I mean, it, it's, it, it's wonderful. I mean, it created the wealth that we are experiencing So anyone denying the positive aspects of capitalism is just, you know, it's just myopic or it's just delusional. So um, there is no denying what we have created through this system. But I think it's equally delusional to fail to recognize the limits. It's time to move on. Yeah, Exa that's exactly on. how I feel, by, by the way. Yeah. Move on. And I think they're moving on. I mean, I was reading Abundance uh, by Peter Diamandis. And I saw in there many aspects of what I think are their correct path. So open source, collaboration, 
Um, it's just more efficient. I mean, from a purely technical point of view, leaving aside the values, which I think are the most important thing, but just leave everything aside. Open source and collaboration is always more efficient than closed source secrecy and uh, competitiveness. So a mixer of these collaborative projects plus open source plus uh, it's, it's this kind of uh, we are in the same boat, let's, <laughs> right? It's, yeah. it's, it's just a ride, let's, let's enjoy it. it, it but in the, summer, in the summer, you are going to meet some of the staunchest supporters of intellectual property rights uh, that you would ever meet, by the way, uh, which, which is fine. Um, anyway, I want to move on by, by asking you, what do you think uh, or um, how likely would you rate uh, the technological singularity to be in the next few decades. What's the percentage or the chances that you imagine it, it might come to, to be? Well, I think the, uh, from the technical point of view, uh, meaning the computational power of computers, I think it's fairly accurate, the prediction by Kurzweil. So 2029, 2030, we're going to have a computer doing 10 to the 19th calculations per second, so our brain does 10 to the 16th or 10 to the 17th according to different measures. So we're going to exceed that. And that's brute force. Yeah. So I don't question that. Um, I don't think the idea of general purpose intelligence even applies to computer in the first place. Because there are some very interesting aspects uh, that, that were brought upon. Well, one would be since computers think differently than we do, or even, even the verb think may not even apply to them, but process information differently from the way we do, um, in order to pass the Turing test, they would have to act differently, or as somebody would say, uh, dumb themselves down. Mm -hmm. That's they what have... David Ferrucci said, by the way, the, yeah. the, the this, this... team leader of Watson. Yeah, because they, they would have so much more knowledge about anything so they would, they, would, they would have to do that incremental step to understand that to, in order to fool us into thinking that they are thinking beings, they would have to act differently from their normal state of mind. They have to play dumb, basically. They have to play dumb, or they have to play human. I wouldn't say play dumb, they have to play <laughs> human. But the thing is, you know, we, I mean, I, I'm looking at you and I see objects I recognize patterns, I don't see pixels, I mean I see a lamp, I see your face, I see you have a microphone, but if I were a computer I would see this matrix of uh, you know, just, just strings of digits of numbers and I would have to interpret them in some way and that is really, um, that, that is really a problem right now, but maybe in 10 years time it would be so trivial that we will look back and say, oh, you know that they didn't have name, uh, name, name algorithm, they we have now ubiquitous and it's so easy to do and it takes so little computational power that they could even do it with their technology, with their computers. So maybe we can, you know, you could discover that you don't need 10 to the 19th or 10 to the 20th operations per second. Maybe you only need 10 to the 12th with the right tools and with the right algorithms. So I don't know, the, it's, it's hard to say if, um, it's hard to say from the um, <laughs> operational aspect. And the other thing is, we give meaning to things. Uh, it's, another, it's another point I stress in the book. I mean, there, there is no meaning to meaning itself. Yeah. It's us who give meaning to things. So, I mean, there was this famous example of this a painter who was a, a, a postmodern painter. He, he did hundreds of paintings that were worth millions of dollars. I don't remember his name, but he, I can check it up on uh, Google after later. So he disappeared, and you know, after a few years, people went back to his house, and they found this painting that was unreleased. Nobody knew of it, and said, "Wow, this is such a, a masterpiece. This is wonderful." And they had all these beautiful conjectures about what it meant, and they, they spoke about, "Oh, this is his, his uh, representation of his childhood." Oh, no, 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 this is unfulfilled dream with his lover, and all kinds of crazy stuff and they were, it was valued millions and millions of dollars. 
Then he pops out again, he was in a spiritual journey somewhere, pops out again and he sees this painting somewhere and says, what the fuck is this? Then, well, this is your painting, your masterpiece. You do. No, that's not my masterpiece. Uh, I just, I just left, I just left it on the, on the ground, and some some of the drops of color dropped right over the painting, and it, it means nothing to me that painting. But everyone thought it was this beautiful masterpiece that was, you know, really controversial. And so, we give meaning to things. I mean, we are gonna love our computers. We're gonna love our robots. We're gonna uh, fall in love with our robots. Somebody will hate them. Somebody will uh, adopt them. We're gonna we're gonna have um, emotional involvement with our machines because event in the end we give meaning to what they are. Mm -hmm. So I, the question is, is open, I guess. Your story reminds me very much to well, to Jackson Pollock. I think uh, they call him the Dripper because he's the guy who paints those paintings by sort of dripping. I, I mean, I don't know. It's probably not him in that story, but. The dripping part reminded me of him. Uh, but so am I to interpret your answer uh, that you basically say that the singularity in the sense that Kurzweil thinks that machines would sort of, in a way, wake up and become smart and self-conscious and so on is not so likely to happen? No, I'm saying it's unpredictable and, uh, well, I'm not really saying it's unpredictable. I'm saying the question might be wrong to begin with. Because mm -hmm. machines would operate on a different level than we do. Mm -hmm. So to say that they will be smarter than us, well, smarter is a relative concept. Machines are mm -hmm. already smarter than us in many areas. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me ask you this then. So what, it, provided this were to happen, what, in your opinion, is our chances as a species of surviving such an event? Well. Um, we are speaking about 2030, uh, right? That, that kind of timeline. 2040s, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because uh, in the book... Timing is not really so important. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's, it's really unpredictable. It depends on our values. I mean, if we, as a species, can kind of come together to agreement, agree on certain universal values and really respect them, then we'll create technology accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, and the question of what happens after 2030, I don't know, it's, it's, it's beyond my, my grasp right now. I could, I could speculate a bit, but on the book I want to really to stay uh, with my feet on the ground and focus on what's happening now. So um, you don't need general artificial intelligence, you don't need a machine to be smarter than a human in every sense, you don't need a machine to pass the Turing test to create an unsustainable economic system that will create widespread disaster and social instability throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And I would like to avoid that. I would like to avoid the widespread riots and suicides and depression and widespread unemployment and all kinds of social problems. So uh, with, with this book, I, I really want to try to give a perspective of how we could escape this problem, this crisis, by leveraging technologies in a smart way to change our values and to leverage these technologies with those new, with those new values to live better. Mm -hmm. I just want to take a moment here to remind our viewers and listeners, uh, if you guys enjoy this show, please help me make it better by writing a short review of it on iTunes or by simply going to our donations page and uh, 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 sending a little bit of money and uh, this would definitely help me make it better and get more and more amazing guests on the show. Um, going back to our interview, Federico, so um, for those of our viewers today who want to find out more about you or your book, uh, where can they go and do that? Well, you can Google my name, uh, <laughs> Federico Pistono, that would be a good start. And uh, I've got, you know, a few websites, the book, robotswillstealyourjob.com. Then I've got Facebook, Twitter, and I post regularly. I have a few followers who also give me uh, many valuable insights and links and ideas. I mean, I have this constant exchange of information and of uh, points of view, which is, which is really challenging and really, really interesting. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I think the creative process is always a, collab a collaborative process. 
Yeah. And it's not full collaboration, it's, it's a mixture of I have to stay by myself, nobody speaks to me for, for a few days, and then I'm open to everyone and let's hear what they have to say. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy the discussion with, you know, at short bursts. <laughs> so uh, the book is coming up uh, in print, right? Yes, it will be on November 5th on um, ebook format and also in print. So I will sell it through the Amazon platform for sure and probably other platforms I'm still considering. Maybe Lulu, maybe the um, iBooks music store. I don't know. It's a, well, it's not a music store. iBooks, uh, iTunes store. iTunes, yeah. Yep. Fantastic. So I think unfortunately we're coming towards the end of our interview here. And um, I'd like to ask you if there's a single thing or a single message that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this interview with you today? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I see many people who are bored. Uh, and to me, that is mind blowing. Because uh, you know, I, I just look at what I do and I could not think, I could not even imagine myself being bored. And the, the advice I, I think I. Uh, I could give to the people is a quote by someone I, I, I forgot and it goes like this um, the cure for boredom is curiosity and there is no cure for curiosity <laughs> I love it okay fantastic Federico Pistano thank you very much for being with us today thank you